You want to know what a politicized judicial system looks like? This is what a politicized judicial system looks like. <laughs> Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and this is the next chapter in the Michael Flynn judicial saga. I have been vlogging on this judicial saga for a while now, explaining the twists and turns and developments and trying to make sense of what probably doesn't make sense to everybody. I am not going to do the 30,000 foot overview summary of the facts. I don't have enough air in my lungs to do that. I have made a Michael Flynn playlist. Give it a watch right here if you are not up to speed on the facts as of the present date. Suffice to say that Michael Flynn was caught up in the Russia collusion investigation. After months of investigation, the FBI found no derogatory information on Michael Flynn. Following one final interview with the FBI, the context of that interview was a little clear as of April 2020. Michael Flynn was found guilty of having made one false statement to the FBI in the context of an FBI investigation. Flynn pleaded guilty ostensibly to avoid jail time and to avoid threats from the FBI to investigate his son. Subsequent to Flynn changing attorneys and disclosure of information that had not yet been disclosed, which seemed to indicate that the purpose of the FBI interview with Michael Flynn was to get him to lie so that he could either be fired or prosecuted, Michael Flynn sought to withdraw his guilty Plea. Also, subsequent to this newly disclosed information indicating the true intent of this last FBI interview with Michael Flynn, the Department of Justice made a motion to dismiss the charges against Michael Flynn. I have done standalone vlogs on all of these issues. I would suggest you give them a watch if you haven't already seen them, but I suspect if you're watching this video, you have already seen them. The Department of Justice made a motion to dismiss, but that motion to dismiss requires leave of the court in order to be granted. That means permission of the court in order to be granted. And that is where we got into the discussion as to what authority the court has to refuse a Department of Justice motion to dismiss charges. Now, there is some disagreement on the level of discretion that the court has to refuse a Department of Justice motion to dismiss the charges. And the judge in Michael Flynn's case, Judge Emmett Sullivan, says, whoa, I'm not so sure I want to grant this motion to dismiss the charges, and because I have nobody arguing for the opposite position, I'm going to appoint an amicus curiae to make the arguments for why I should reject the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss. By all accounts, Judge Sullivan's decision to unilaterally appoint an amicus curiae to present opposing arguments for the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss seems to be relatively unheard of. Flynn's attorney subsequently filed a petition for writ of mandamus to the Court of Appeal in joining Judge Sullivan to grant the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss. The Court of Appeal weighed in. They gave Judge Sullivan, I think it was 10 days to explain why he was doing what he was doing. I did a video breaking down his brief. I'm going to link that video right here. And the Court of Appeal scheduled a hearing date on the arguments on the issue of the mandamus for June 12th, which is tomorrow as of the time of shooting this vlog. But before the three-judge panel of the Court of Appeal could hear the arguments on the mandamus, the amicus curiae filed their brief explaining why Judge Sullivan should reject the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss the charges against Michael Flynn. Just appreciate the absurdity of the situation. If the writ of mandamus is issued, Judge Sullivan is going to be compelled to dismiss the charges against Michael Flynn. And before those arguments are made and the Court of Appeal comes to a decision on the petition for writ of mandamus, the amicus curiae is filing a brief to Judge Sullivan explaining why Judge Sullivan should reject the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss the charges against Michael Flynn. It is Kafkaesque insanity. Pure Kafkaesque insanity. If the Court of Appeal issues the writ of mandamus, Judge Sullivan is going to be compelled to dismiss the charges against Michael Flynn, and that entire brief written by the amicus curiae becomes without object. All 82 pages of it become without object. Why did the amicus curiae have to draft and file an 82-page argument brief for Judge Sullivan before the Court of Appeal adjudicated on the petition for writ of mandamus? He didn't. In fact, according to Sullivan's own schedule in the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss, those arguments are only scheduled to be heard on July 16th. But whatever, the amicus curiae did not need to file the brief before the hearing before the Court of Appeal, but they did, so let's read it. Identity and interest of the amicus curiae. On May 13, 2020, this court entered an order appointing me as amicus curiae, quote, to present arguments in opposition to the government's motion to dismiss and to, quote, address whether the court should issue an order to show cause why Mr. Flynn should not be held in criminal contempt for perjury pursuant to 18 U.S.C. Section 401, Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 42, the court's inherent authority and any other applicable statutes, rules, or controlling law. This order was consistent with settled law and practice respecting the appointment of amici in criminal cases. Nothing like the court-appointed amici confirming the validity of his or her appointment. And as far as I understand it, there is some disagreement as to whether or not this is consistent with settled law. That is exactly why the issue is going before the Court of Appeal tomorrow. Preliminary statement. The government seeks leave of court to dismiss its false statement charge against defendant Michael T. Flynn. Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 48A controls that request. Under Rule 48A, the government's motion should be denied on two separate grounds. First, the requirement of judicial approval entitles the judge to obtain and evaluate the prosecutor's reasons. Here, the government's statement of reasons for seeking dismissal is pretextual. The government 
claims there is insufficient evidence to prove materiality and falsity, but even giving it the benefit of every doubt and recognizing its prerogative to assess the strength of its own case, this contention, quote, taxes the credulity of the credulous. The government's ostensible grounds for seeking the dismissal are conclusively disproven by its own briefs filed earlier in this very proceeding. Second, the court should deny leave because there is clear evidence of a gross abuse of prosecutorial power. Rule 48A was designed to, quote, guard against dubious dismissals of criminal cases that would benefit powerful and well-connected defendants. In other words, the rule empowers courts to protect the integrity of their own proceedings from prosecutors who undertake corrupt, politically motivated dismissals. Incidentally, and we'll get into this later, it was also intended to protect against judicial harassment. But as we are going to see, this entire brief is the embodiment of Rashomon. Akira Kurosawa, Rashomon. The original one screen, two films. That is what happened here. The government has engaged in highly irregular conduct to benefit a political ally of the president. The facts of this case overcome the presumption of regularity. The court should therefore deny the government's motion to dismiss, adjudicate any remaining motions, and then sentence the defendant. The court has also asked me to address whether it should issue an order to show cause why Flynn should not be held in criminal contempt for perjury. Flynn has indeed committed perjury in these proceedings for which he deserves punishment, and the court has the authority to initiate a prosecution for that crime. I respectfully recommend, however, that the court not exercise that authority. Rather, it should take Flynn's perjury into account in sentencing him on the offense to which he has already admitted guilt. This approach, rather than a separate prosecution for perjury or contempt, aligns with the court's intent to treat this case and this defendant in the same way it would any other. And what do I mean when I say one screen, two films? Here, Gleason is saying that the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss is intended to benefit an ally of Donald Trump. The flip side is that a ton of people would say that the entire prosecution of Michael Flynn by the Department of Justice was intended to punish an ally of Donald Trump. And when Gleason says that Michael Flynn has indeed committed perjury, you want Kafka-esque? He's saying that Michael Flynn committed perjury because Flynn either lied when he pleaded guilty or is lying when he's pleading innocent. But yeah, no one was trying to trick Michael Flynn. If you don't get the reference, check out my previous vlog on the subject. Then we get into a lengthy recital of the facts, which really don't differ materially from the description of the facts in any of the other motions. The interesting thing in all of this is that everyone pretty much agrees on the facts, although people place greater or lesser emphasis on the facts if they are more or less favorable to them. The differences of opinion come in the qualification of those facts. One screen, two films. The amicus describes the conversations between Michael Flynn and Kislyak. Intelligence and national security officials who learned of these conversations or otherwise had access to them regarded them as irregular and worrisome. As mentioned in previous vlogs, the FBI had transcripts of these conversations, and although they found them troublesome or worrisome, no actual charges came of the actual conversation itself. Further developments increased the concerns arising from the Flynn Kislyak calls. On January 12, 2017, a Washington Post columnist reported that Flynn had, quote, phoned Kislyak, quote, several times the day the sanctions were announced. Then the amicus describes that fateful interview with the FBI, the only interview from which any charges against Flynn arose. About two hours later, two FBI agents interviewed Flynn in the White House. They came prepared to, quote, refresh Flynn's recollection if he, quote, said he did not remember something they knew he said, in which case they would employ, quote, the exact words Flynn used during the calls. Flynn, who was, quote, relaxed and jocular, treated the agents, quote, as allies. Throughout the interview, Flynn, a career military intelligence official, projected a, quote, very sure demeanor and exhibited no, quote, indicators of deception. Both agents took handwritten notes and memorialized Flynn's responses afterward in an official memorandum. And we know what then happened. Flynn provided equivocal answers, which the FBI later determined to be lies and press charges against Michael Flynn for making false statements to the FBI. After he, quote, reflected further, Flynn, quote, stated he did not think he would have had a conversation with Kislyak about the matter, as he did not know the expulsions were coming. Flynn stated he did not have a long, drawn-out discussion with Kislyak where he would have asked him to, quote, don't do something. These answers were false. As he later admitted under oath on multiple occasions, Flynn remembered his discussions with Kislyak and chose to lie repeatedly to avoid discussing them with the FBI. When reading anything, it is very important to distinguish fact from opinion. Generally speaking, describing something as false is more a matter of fact, whereas qualifying it as a lie is more a matter of opinion. That Flynn might have said something false, I think most people could probably even agree with. That he would have deliberately chosen to repeatedly lie about something to avoid discussing it with the FBI when he knew that the FBI already had that information in their possession, I think people are going to have a bigger problem with that. Just as a pure matter of logic, typically one does not lie to someone who they know has the information about which he would be lying if he were lying. Typically, but maybe I'm giving Flynn too much credit despite his decades of untarnished public service. Flynn is fired for lying. After the interview, the FBI agents briefed their superiors and DOJ officials. DOJ officials who examined the discrepancies between Flynn's account and the content of the calls, or were otherwise informed of them, found it very unlikely Flynn could have forgotten his recent discussions with Kislyak. The amicus qualifies the DOJ's motion to dismiss the charges as purely political. A lot of people might be looking at this prosecution and qualifying it as purely political. Rashomon, one screen, two films throughout this entire brief. On November 30th, 
2017, Flynn agreed to plead guilty to making false statements to federal investigators in violation of 18 U.S.C. sections 1001A2. Under penalty of perjury, Flynn endorsed a statement of the offense admitting that his repeated statements to the FBI that he did not remember his discussions with Kislyak concerning the U.S. sanctions were false and that he knew so at the time. Political affiliation aside, I hope everyone appreciates what's going on here. They are now saying that when Michael Flynn said, I do not remember, that he lied because he did in fact remember when he said, I don't remember. That is the basis for his false statement to the FBI. Let that sink in. He also admitted that his repeated statements to the FBI that he did not remember his discussions with Kislyak concerning the earlier UN resolution were false and that he knew so at the time. Flynn confirmed that his lies, quote, had a material impact on the FBI's ongoing investigation into the existence of any links or coordination between individuals associated with the campaign and Russia's efforts to interfere with the 2016 presidential election, i.e. the Crossfire Hurricane investigation. And here, as Orwellian as it does in fact sound, the amicus is describing how they got Flynn to confirm something for and on behalf of the FBI. Appreciate that. They got Flynn to confirm that his lies were material for the FBI's investigation. Who except the FBI could confirm a fact like that? Flynn further admitted making additional materially false statements and omissions in FARA filings related to his work for the principal benefit of the Republic of Turkey, though he was not charged for that conduct. And then in June 2019, Flynn hires new counsel who seem to be doing a bit of a better job than his previous counsel. Finally, on April 24th and 30th, Flynn supplemented his motion to dismiss with four additional exhibits. The first two are emails between Flynn's former attorneys and the government, heavily redacted, that purportedly show that the prosecution struck a, quote, side deal, not to prosecute Flynn's son that had to, quote, be kept secret and was a, quote, material term of the plea agreement, reprising the, quote, threat argument he previously made. The court coerces Michael Flynn to confirm under oath, under penalty of perjury, that he is entering a plea of guilty willingly, freely, and not under duress. And then we find out that there was a little bit of context to that admission. And let's see how the amicus qualifies the other two exhibits filed in support of Michael Flynn's motion to dismiss. The other exhibits are internal FBI emails, notes, text messages, and a draft of a memorandum that would have closed the Crossfire Razor investigation, all of which Flynn offered in support of previously raised claims that, quote, partisan DOJ and FBI officials, quote, conspired to destroy him by tricking him into lying to the agents who interviewed him. Those are the now infamous internal FBI notes where they were pontificating as to what the purpose of this additional interview was with Mr. Flynn. Was it to get him to lie so that he could get fired or prosecuted? On May 7, the government moved to dismiss the case against Flynn. The only signatory was a political appointee, then acting United States Attorney for the District of Columbia, Timothy Shea. Earlier the same day, a career prosecutor who had worked on the case since before charges were filed withdrew from it. Then we get into the argument on the scope and application of the famous Rule 48A. And the funny thing is, reading this, I think everybody agrees in principle, they just don't agree on the application to the facts. The text and history of Rule 48A demonstrate that the court plays a limited but vital role in determining whether to grant the government leave to dismiss a pending criminal charge, regardless of whether that motion is opposed or supported by the defendant. A limited but vital role. Therefore, the question here is not whether Rule 48A vests this court with discretion, but rather how much discretion and under what circumstances it may be properly exercised to deny leave. Flynn and the government have argued that judges have such discretion only when the defendant opposes a Rule 48a motion and have none when the defendant consents. That may be something of an oversimplified or inaccurate description of Flynn and the government's position, but they will have their day in court to argue. Following the enactment of Rule 48a, courts appreciated that the discretion invested must be exercised in a manner consistent with the separation of powers. This analysis included a recognition that Rule 48a is, quote, a power to check power and that the Constitution, quote, enjoins upon its branches separateness but interdependence, autonomy but reciprocity. The amicus then goes into a brief history of the adoption of Rule 48A, and according to the amicus, that rule was adopted to prevent the political dismissal of criminal charges to highly connected individuals. I suspect this is but one side of the coin, and from what I understand, there is another side to the coin, which is that Rule 48A was also enacted to prevent judicial harassment of defendants. Regardless, arguments will be made tomorrow, as of the time of shooting this vlog. Guided by Rule 48A's text and history as well as separation of powers principles. There are two grounds for denying leave of court. First, quote, the requirement of judicial approval entitles the judge to obtain and evaluate the prosecutor's reasons. Those reasons must be real and credible. Where they are demonstrably pretextual, the court may deny leave under Rule 48A. Second, courts may deny Rule 48A motions based on clear evidence of gross prosecutorial abuse. And what do you think the amicus is going to argue? Spoiler alert, the amicus is going to argue that it is pretextual and it is the result of gross prosecutorial abuse. Rashomon, one screen, two films. Both grounds for denying leave of court under Rule 48A are present in this case. The reasons offered by the government are so irregular 
and so obviously pretextual that they are deficient. Moreover, the facts surrounding the filing of the government's motion constitute clear evidence of gross prosecutorial abuse. They reveal an unconvincing effort to disguise as legitimate a decision to dismiss that is based solely on the fact that Flynn is a political ally of President Trump. Whereas others are going to look at the entire prosecution of Flynn and conclude that it was the product of gross prosecutorial abuse strictly because Flynn was a political ally of Donald Trump. Materiality. The heart of the government's motion is a claimed 11th hour doubt on its part that Flynn's lies were, quote, material to an FBI investigation. The claim is not credible. A false statement is material under 18 U.S.C. section 1001 when it has, quote, a natural tendency to influence or is capable of influencing either a discrete decision or any other function of the agency to which it was addressed. Critically, the test is objective. It first looks to, quote, qualities of the statement that transcend the immediate circumstances in which it is offered and inhere in the statement itself. It then asks whether a statement of that kind is, quote, capable of affecting the, quote, general function that a federal agency was performing when the statement was made to it. While serving as the National Security Advisor, Flynn repeatedly lied about the nature and extent of his communications with a senior official of a hostile foreign power that was being sanctioned by the U.S. government for interfering with the U.S. presidential election. Much of the government's brief implies that the FBI interviewers had the sole nefarious purpose of getting Flynn to lie rather than gathering information because the FBI already knew what Flynn and Kislyak had said to one another. Even putting aside the fact that such an allegation does not raise a cognizable defense, the government's narrative is riddled with plot holes. Now everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but some opinions are more just justifiable than others, why exactly is that not a cognizable defense? For example, as agreed before the interview, when Flynn claimed to have forgotten aspect of the calls, the agents decided to help him out. They deliberately, quote, refreshed Flynn's recollection by repeatedly prompting him with, quote, the exact words Flynn used in his conversations with Kislyak when he failed to bring up or claim to have forgotten aspects of their conversations. If the agents were deviously trying to trick Flynn into lying, they did a terrible job. What? How exactly does that follow? If the FBI was indeed trying to trick Flynn into lying, they either did just that or they interpreted what he said as a lie as they specified in those internal notes that were only revealed in April 2020. All right, and it goes on and it goes back to the idea that Flynn confirmed to the court the materiality of his lies to the FBI as relates to the FBI's investigation, an admission that as far as I am concerned, Flynn is not capable of making in fact or in law. But alas, the court got him to make that admission under penalty of perjury. As relates to the falsity of Michael Flynn's statements, the amicus argues as follows. As a fallback, though with virtually no explanation for its reversal. The government says that it now doubts its ability to prove Flynn knowingly lied to the FBI. This claim is even more implausible than its claim regarding materiality. In fact, the government does not even have to prove Flynn's guilt. He has pled guilty. If his motion to withdraw that plea is reinstated after this court denies the government's motion to dismiss, it will fail. A plea of guilty, quote, is a grave and solemn act to be accepted only with care and discernment. And Flynn's plea had been accepted by two judges in this district. And we now know the context under which that plea was accepted by the court in that Michael Flynn could never take it back under penalty of perjury, notwithstanding FBI misconduct. Flynn has freely admitted his guilt and agreed to cooperate with the government because his guilt could hardly be more provable. This is a statement of opinion and not a statement of fact, and a statement of opinion with which a great many people might disagree. Even absent Flynn's confessions, the proof that he lied is straightforward. We know exactly what Flynn said to Kislyak. Transcripts document their whole exchange. We know exactly what Flynn said to the FBI. The interviewing agents have a clear account of how Flynn described those calls and the details of that account are corroborated by their contemporaneous notes. And now might be a good time to point out that no actual charges came of the actual exchange between Flynn and Kislyak, but rather only of his failure to properly recollect the content of that exchange. The executive branch had the unreviewable discretion to never charge Flynn with a crime because he is a friend and political ally of President Trump. President Trump today has the unreviewable authority to issue a pardon, thus ensuring that Flynn is no longer prosecuted and never punished for his crimes because he's a friend and political ally. And here, an astute observer might actually notice that the amicus just showed us his hand. The amicus inadvertently admitted the very strategy behind this whole ordeal. They want Trump to pardon Flynn so that it becomes a political pardon and not a judicial exoneration. As far as I am concerned, the amicus just inadvertently admitted the strategy of Sullivan behind appointing the amicus in the first place. Then, predictably, the amicus concludes that Flynn lied, and although he shouldn't face charges for contempt, the fact that he lied should factor into his sentencing. After all of this punish Flynn even harder, sentence him to an even longer time in jail, force Trump's hand to pardon him so that it becomes a political pardon as opposed to a judicial exoneration. And this might be the most glorious part of the entire brief. Here, Flynn did not simply seek to withdraw his plea, but did so by mounting a frontal assault on the integrity of the investigation. This was deliberately obstructive and forms part of a pattern of conduct that reflects a complete disregard for the judicial 
judicial process. As Robert Barnes succinctly put it, now defending yourself and exposing government misconduct is obstructing justice. This is Soviet-style justice. And seemingly lacking any understanding of the concept of projection, the amicus concludes as follows. The Department of Justice has a solemn responsibility to prosecute this case like every other case without fear or favor and, to quote the department's motto, solely, quote, on behalf of justice. It has abdicated that responsibility through a gross abuse of prosecutorial power, attempting to provide special treatment to a favored friend and political ally of the President of the United States. While others might argue that this is the exact modus and animus with which this case was prosecuted from the very beginning against Michael Flynn. So that's it. I hope I was able to explain this, break it down, simplify it, give you some sort of enhanced understanding of the argument brief itself. If you like my videos and you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a comment in the comment section below. It feeds the algorithm. If you want to support the channel, all of these support links are in the pinned comment. We've got merch, new merch, PayPal, subscribe star, Patreon. But if you share the channel, that is the greatest form of support. We will see if this brief ever makes it to a hearing date. We'll see how the Court of Appeal rules on the petition for writ of mandamus, but at the very least, now you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah!